Hello friends, welcome to another discussion from my series on the serotonin system. I hope that as this, as this discussion is going along, the terms that relate to the serotonin system like CERT and MEOA and the individual receptor subtypes and the synthesis of serotonin, the enzymes involved, all this is becoming a little bit more familiar to you and you're getting a sense, hopefully, of the effects of serotonin in the brain and a little bit uh, to a lesser degree in the body, which maybe we haven't gotten to as much yet. Uh, today I wanted to talk to you guys about uh, cognitive decline as it relates to serotonin with aging. Before I do, I want to mention something that I didn't want to make a video on uh, by itself, but I just thought to mention it here since this is sort of the final uh, episode in my, I guess, you know, because we talked about depression, we talked about anxiety, now we're talking about cognitive decline, and so these are all sort of pathological um, mental states. And I haven't really d done much research on bipolar disorder and schizophrenia because that isn't really my focus. But I did, in my research on, ser on the serotonin system, I came across the subject of autism because this is one of the things most linked to serotonin. So I thought I'll mention that briefly here, then we'll talk about cognitive decline, okay? So the brief thing I wanted to mention is that since 1961, uh, autism has been linked to serotonin. Uh, specifically, um, the polymorphisms in the, cert, uh, the serotonin transporter are linked to autism and serotonergic activity is linked to autism. Uh, one third of all autistic children have elevated uh, blood levels of serotonin and one half of all severely ment mentally handicapped children have elevated serotonin levels in their blood. What does that mean? We don't know exactly. There is a serotonin hypothesis of autism, but there are also other hypotheses. So it's not completely understood, obviously, and uh, the whole study of autism has really changed a lot in the last 15 years, and it's not really my specialty, and there's too much, uh, obviously I'm not a researcher, but I am a reader of research, and there's not too much incentive for me to dig into extremely pathological states because I still have so much more papers to read about non-pathological states. But moving on away from this, yeah, I mentioned everything I wanted to mention. Moving on away from this, I want to talk about uh, aging and cognitive decline as it relates to serotonin. And this is more relevant to everybody. And it's not because we're all going to get older. No, it's because you guys may notice that I am very interested in Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. I was not originally interested in them. I don't have a family history of either of them. I mean, I was a little bit concerned about Parkinson's disease because I, I was, you know, since childhood I had an essential tremor, which means my hands and something my neck shake uncontrollably. And so I was concerned that that makes me more predisposed towards Parkinson's disease, which, spoiler alert, it does, turns out, but <laughs> genetically. But um, the important thing is that I wasn't really, I don't have any family members with either of them. And maybe you are watching this right now and you also don't. So you may think, hey, is this relevant for me? It is. The reason why is that the greatest minds in the world that are researching uh, in the ways that we can use to improve brain function are working on Alzheimer's disease and to a lesser degree Parkinson's disease, Huntington's disease, uh, uh, ALS, MS, all of these diseases. So these are what are called the class of diseases called neurodegenerative diseases, which means they're diseases of the nervous system and of nerves and neurons, and they're a little bit different. All of them are a little bit different, but they all share some characteristics. So for example, for example, they're all marked by increased inflammatory, an increased inflammatory state in the nervous system. And this is something that affects all of us because, see while studies, for example, in depression may be a little bit more helpful because, you know, we all potentially can get a little bit depressed, but we may not be you know, actually this is, they're equally relevant to be honest, because a lot of us actually do have amyloid plaques even if we never develop uh, Alzheimer's disease. But the important thing, what I'm trying to say is that, um, you know, the, the inflammatory uh, condition that exists in neurodegenerative diseases is certainly something that we all can experience and just the way that they try to target it in neurodegenerative diseases to help the symptoms of their disease, we uh, prophylactically can also target it, hopefully, not excessively, just to ensure that we do less damage to our brains and nervous systems. The main goal of this is to limit the cognitive decline that happens to all people past the age of, say, 25. And so for our purposes of cognitive enhancement, so when I look at cognitive enhancement, the way I think of it is, 
I think of it as three, three things. Number one, optimizing brain performance for the purpose of whatever tasks that are at hand. Number two, optimizing uh, mental well-being. And number three, limiting the decline of brain function as I age. And the reason the third one is also important is because everybody's brain ages. Even if they don't have Alzheimer's or neurodegenerative diseases in their family or in their genetic predispositions. For example, the best way you can tell that is that the so, sort of the Nobel Prize of Mathematics, you, you, I don't know if you've noticed, but there's no Nobel Prize of Mathematics, but there's a Fields Medal, which is considered sort of the equivalent. The Fields Medal is rarely given to anybody above the age of 30. And there are tons of mathematicians that are 40, 50 years old. They can't win the field medal. Why? Their creative, I mean, we, we can get into more details, but basically their creative and, you know, uh, their functional intelligence that regards new problems declines at past the age of 20. And so do all, most of the neurotrophic factors in the brain, which is these growth factors in the brain. So people are often concerned about, oh, my growth hormone is declining, my testosterone is declining, but what about the growth factors in the brain? So, you see what I mean? Anyway, the important thing is, I, this is a little off topic, but the important thing is, a lot of the results of studies or even the papers on Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease are where I find some of my ideas for what I can do to enhance my brain function or to limit the decline of my brain. So let's talk about this. First of all, we know that as people age, their serotonergic activity declines and the number of serotonergic neurons in their RAF nuclei or the in the RAF nucleus, which is where, remember, that's where serotonin is produced in the brain and it's sent to the forebrain and also to the backwards, they decline as people age. So in general, there is lower serotonergic activity as people age. I don't know if you've noticed this with people in your own family, but you may notice that as people uh, approach the age of 50 or 60, they tend to smile less. I'm not saying this is serotonin. They also have less dopaminergic activity. They have a lot of other things, but it's interesting to think about, right? So let's talk first briefly about Parkinson's disease. There are three things I want to tell you. Number one, and this is really interesting. I, I really think this is interesting. Number one, they lose, in Parkinson's disease, there's a characteristic in which over time, there is a gradual loss of the CERT transporter of serotonin in the RAF nucleus, number one. Number two, there is, so there's, there's, a, there's a number of kinds of Parkinson's tremors. Tremors means shaking of the body or problems in gait or movement of the, of the limbs. One of them is called rest and re-emergent tremors. There is a hypothesis in the study of Parkinson's disease that the way that rest and re-emergent tremors develop is not actually due to a decline in dopaminergic function because most of Parkinson's disease is thought to be due to a decline in dopaminergic neurons in the nucleus accumbens and, and related dopaminergic signaling and so the main treatment of Parkinson's disease is agonists of dopaminergic receptors or um, you know taking L-dopa uh, which is like taking 5-HTP. Anyway, so there's a theory that these rest and re-emergent tremors are not actually due to dopaminergic neuronal loss, but due to serotonergic loss. And in fact, there is uh, an association of the severity of rest and re-emergent tremors with uh, the loss of CERT in the RAF nuclei. Fascinating. So it is possible that part, part of Parkinson's disease and part of a particular kind of tremor is due actually to a loss of serotonergic uh, integrity in the brain. Now, it's also known, uh, or there's sort of a, uh, an informal consensus among Parkinson's disease researchers that the anxiety that characterizes Parkinson's disease, which is, a, by the way, something many people don't know about, there's a, both in Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease, there is a, a, a development of anxiety and depression. Uh, so the anxiety in Parkinson's disease is thought to be due to this loss of serotonergic function at the RAF nucleus. Now talking about Alzheimer's disease, there's a couple of things I wanted to say here also. Number one, SSRIs slow the progression of cognitive impairment in AD. They're not an effective treatment, but they have been observed to slow the progression. See, in, in Alzheimer's disease, which is called AD and Parkinson's disease called PD, when Alzheimer's disease, as it progresses, which it really begins in the 30s or 40s of a person's age, as it progresses, slowly a person loses function of their brain and eventually they die from like loss of function of the brain uh, if, if they live long enough to die from it or they may die from something else, right? But 
basically it's shown that SSRIs reduce this progression, the rate of the progression. And the reason it's thought to do this is because it seems to inhibit the synthesis of amyloid, of beta amyloid precursor protein of a pathological variety. There's a couple of ways in which this kind of protein can be uh, synthesized. And one of them leads to this pathological kind of what are called uh, uh, amyloid plaques in the brain. So I mentioned this before, but Alzheimer's disease is characterized by tau, triangle, tau uh, tangles, and, which are intracellular, and extracellular amyloid beta plaques. So SSRIs seem to reduce the, synthesis, the rate of synthesis of these amyloid beta plaques, which is really protective. Interestingly, and I probably should have left this till the SSRI section, but interestingly, so this is another thing I want to talk about, and this really excites me. This is why I do this kind of research. So when I did the uh, research on the acetylcholine system, I was surprised to realize that although there may be some preferential elements to agonizing some of the nicotinic cholinergic receptors, in general, all of those receptors, the nicotinic cholinergic receptors, seemed attractive to agonize, which is why nicotine is so associated with neuroprotection and with uh, learning and memory and everything else. But there are another uh, class of receptors called the, oh, there's a weird pen, I have a purple pen today. <laughs> there's another class of receptors called the muscarinic cholinergic receptors. And these receptors are not so benign and not so helpful in general. But there are a couple of them that appear to be helpful, either neuroprotective or potentially cognition enhancing. You can see my series on acetylcholine, I should probably link the series here. But the point is, I discovered this when I got really into the grains of the research or into the, you know, detail of the research. In researching serotonin, I also discovered this interesting thing, which I've mentioned before when we were talking about the serotonin receptors, which is that antagonizing the 5-HT6 receptor produces memory enhancement in the brain. And it appears to do this by turning off mTOR complex 1 in the brain, locally, which is very interesting. And paradoxically also, agonizing the 5-HT6 receptor has also been shown to improve learning and memory in the brain. And not only that, but fasting, the, uh, not fasting, but caloric restriction, which is also applies to fasting. The, the memory enhancement that comes from caloric restriction is, appears to be modulated by 5-HT6, the sixth class of serotonin receptors, it modulating mTORC. So it's in between calorie restriction and mTORC1 in the brain. So, for the sake of Al Alzheimer's disease, researchers have been researching the antagonism, selective antagonism of 5-HT6 receptors for the purpose of improving cognition. And they also have a generally shared view that agonizing the 5-HT2, I think, A receptor, the 5-HT2A receptor, the 5-HT4 receptor, and the 5-HT7 receptor may be helpful for the prevention of Alzheimer's disease. And if you think about it, really agonizing the 5-HT1A receptor, as long as you don't re reduce serotonin synthesis in the brain, would do the same thing because it increases neurotrophic factors. One of the hallmarks of all ne neurodegenerative diseases is the loss of neurons with time. This also happens with traumatic brain injury. If any of you guys have been in a fight before, a real fight, you probably, a lot of the guys who watch my channel are men. You've probably experienced neuronal loss. I certainly have, everybody has. And uh, as, we, as we age, those, those growth factors are not there as, anymore. So not just in a pathological state, but even if you've been hit on the head playing football or anything else, you've lost some neurons in your, in your brain. And generally, as you age, you're going to lose more and more neurons. So the 5-HT1A receptor, agonizing that seems to cause neurogenesis, which SSRIs do as well. Um, so it may be, it may be uh, reducing the... Um, decline in, in cognition with Alzheimer's disease through that as well, not just through the beta amyloid uh, synthesis reduction. So that's what I wanted to say about neurodegenerative diseases. As you can see, this is a very interesting topic. One would theorize that potentially combining an SSRI with a 5-HT6 antagonist, which are not available on the market, at, or at least yet. This is why I, <laughs> this is why we have the Reddit and I have uh, great people on the Reddit like Il Toscano, who is uh, looking out for us trying to find people to produce things for us. And by the way, if you guys are looking for other things, uh, a selective agonist of the muscarinic receptors, of two of the muscarinic receptors would be great as well. But so combining these things can optimize your protocol for your cognition, you know? I forgot to mention earlier, the problem with the muscarinic receptors and why it was interesting in the first place is that acetylcholine agonizes all of them. So acetylcholine, the natural neurotransmitter, which people, cognitive enhancement people love to take alpha-GPC or take phosphatidylcholine, 
that agonizes all of the receptors, the nicotinic and the muscarinic, some of them unhelpful. So what is ideal really is to enhance the nicotinic cholinergic agonism and then select, be selective about the muscarinic ones. And see in this case with serotonin, we may want to uh, inhibit CERT a little bit and then we might, may want to selectively antagonize 5-HT6. And potentially we may want to antagonize another of the receptors as well. We should get into more of this in a separate video. Anyway, thank you guys for bearing with me. I know this was a little uh, not straightforward, the discussion, but I hope it was entertaining. I'll see you guys next time.